let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to John 17. We're back, and hopefully we will be here a little while. Uh, Not necessarily in John 17, but in the Gospel of John. I know we've had some different messages brought forth over the holiday season, right? And it's uh, always to anticipate that every year, and we look forward to special times in God's Word during the holiday seasons, but now we're sort of back in the rhythm of normal ministry, uh, second Sunday, I believe, in the new year, and hopefully we'll be making our way through the rest of John's Gospel. We're coming to the good stuff, if you want to think about it in that sense. The Lord's passion is what's on the horizon. As you look at the Gospel of John, we'll be finishing up John's, you know, Jesus' prayer, moving into the Garden of Gethsemane. In John 18 and then John 19, 20 and following, we will see the Lord's passion, resurrection, and all the wonderful things that uh, John will present to us in his wonderful gospel. But this morning, we find ourselves in the middle of this wonderful prayer of our Lord, and we're going to read this morning verses 13 through 19. Uh, We started a few weeks ago with Uh, This particular section of the prayer in verse 9, and this morning we're going to be looking at the latter part of this prayer, starting in verse 13 through 19 together. So follow with me as we read this section of Scripture together. This is, again, our Lord. This is His prayer uh, for the disciples. This is Thursday night of Passion Week, right before His arrest, and this is our Lord's prayer to the Father on their behalf. He says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. Quite a a few weeks ago, we started looking at the second part of our Lord's prayer here. And here in John 17, Jesus is, uh, has three, really three specific groups that he is praying for. And one of those groups is these 11 apostles, these 11 disciples. These disciples, if we were to sort of look at them in detail, we were made up of fishermen, were made up of tax collectors, a really unlikely band of brothers. Not those maybe you would typically think of as men you'd choose to be the Lord's disciples, right? These would not these would not be your first choice. In all probability, the criteria you and I probably would use in selecting men for this particular job would not equal the Lord's requirements, right? We'd typically go to the halls of religion we would typically go through the halls of education to, mo- to a, maybe even a place of prominence and try to find the brightest and the best of those whom we would see fit to fill the shoes of the apostles. This is what we would do. This is what human wisdom would do. But the apostle Paul, if you will, bear with me this morning. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a minute. In verse 26, reminds us who the Lord calls. Listen to what he says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 1. He says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God, not you, think about it in that way, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no, now here is the reason why God does this. Look at verse 29. So that no man may boast before God. Paul ends that sentence powerfully. 
The reason God doesn't choose the mighty, the noble, the prominent is because it is not about them. It is all about God. This is what Paul, this is, what Paul is saying. And is this not true, if you'll turn back to John 17, is this not true of the 11 disciples, tax collectors, fishermen, blue collar at best, right? And we love the disciples not just because of what they've done by the power of God, But I believe we love the disciples because they remind us of ourselves to some degree, don't they? We see their weakness. We see their sins. We see their lack of faith. We see their pride. Their eagerness without knowledge all remind us of ourselves. But it also teaches us another important truth that God does not call the gifted Rather, he gifts those who are called, right? This is true because it is all for the glory of God. This is true here of the 11 disciples. This is really why we find them at the core of Jesus' high priestly prayer. Because it would be these men that the Lord has chosen to be his apostles, It would be these 11 men that God has chosen to be His special envoy to the world. The glory of Jesus Christ, really, if we think about this prayer, is on full display. Right here, right before His coming death. Rather than being concerned for Himself, Jesus is concerned for these 11 men and their ministries. He is a concern for the church that he is going to lay his life down for. Throughout this night, as we unfold in the next chapters of John's Gospel, we will see the embodiment of selfless service from Jesus. And in great part, his service, his selfless service, is found in this prayer for these 11 men. And the last time we were in John 17, we began looking at four features of Jesus' prayers for the apostles. And it all started in verse 9. Verse 9, Jesus transitions from praying for himself in verses 1 through 8 to praying specifically for the apostles. And starting in verse 9 through verse 12, a few weeks ago, we looked at two of these features The first feature was the exclusive nature of those Jesus prayed for. And you can see that in verse 9. He says, I ask on their behalf. I don't ask on behalf of the world. He's not praying for the world. He's not praying for any other person here. He's praying specifically for the apostles to whom the God the Father has chosen in eternity past to give the Son to be the foundation of the church. It is an exclusive prayer for these particular men. And then we saw the protective nature of this prayer. And it starts in verse 11. And Jesus says, Father, I am no longer in the world. He's speaking about his ascension. He's speaking about his future exaltation. He says, in light of this, Father, I want you to protect these to whom you have given me. In verse 12, he says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished. So Jesus here has four distinct features that he uh, uses, so to speak, in praying for these disciples. And this morning, we're going to finish those four. The next feature of Jesus' prayer here for the disciples is found in verse 13 and 14, the preparatory nature for those Jesus prays. The preparatory nature of those that Jesus prays. Look at verse 13. He says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Now, what I want you to notice, first off, this morning, is in verse 13, 
Jesus, again, is pointing to his departure. Look at it. But now I come to you. This has been the theme from the beginning. He has asked the Father to glorify himself through glorifying his Son through his rightful place that he had before the foundation of the world. Then in verse, I believe it is in verse 11, he says, I am no longer in the world. Jesus is speaking prophetically. He's saying, I will be in the near future in heaven with you, Father. And here in verse 13, he picks that theme up again. This is the reason Jesus prays for these apostles. This is the reason Jesus is offering this high priestly prayer on behalf of these apostles because Jesus knows of his absence. Things are going to change. And since Jesus will be returning to the right hand of the Father, Jesus here speaks of how he has prepared these men for the next season of their ministry without him. And this morning, in these few verses, I want you to notice three elements of their preparation. He talks about joy here. He talks about how he gave them Uh, the Father's Word, and then he prays in conclusion of that about their protection. That's what you see in verses 13 through 15. So this is the preparatory nature of Jesus' prayer for these 11 men. So the first aspect of Jesus' prayer of preparation for these disciples is joy. Look at verse 13. He says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Now, when we think about preparation for ministry, joy is probably not the first on your list, right? When you think about getting ready to serve the Lord, whether it's vocational ministry or whether it is lay ministry, wherever that might be, The first thing on your list on what will prepare you for that divine calling usually is not the subject of joy. But for Jesus it is. Because he knows joy is critical. Joy is the most important attribute for ministry. It is the vital attitude that must be fostered in gospel ministry. I want you to notice how Jesus develops this thought of joy. Look what he says in verse 13. These things I speak in the world. Let's stop there. What does this mean? What is Jesus doing here? Why is he saying this? Why is he talking about, I have spoken these things to the world? Well, he is not speaking to the world, is he? Where is he? Well, he is either in the upper room still, Or they're making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He's not speaking these things to the world. He's speaking these things to the ears of the eleven only. But this is just Jesus' way in praying to talk about his his words, his prayers, his thoughts. Uh, Everything he said up to this point has been done publicly in the hearing of the eleven disciples on this Thursday night. He has not hidden these truths from these disciples. Rather, he has prayed openly in their hearing. That is to say, all that they have heard. When Jesus turns his eyes and ears toward heaven, in verse 1 it says he lifts his eyes toward heaven. The disciples see this. And then Jesus begins to utter this prayer, and they begin to listen to the words that Jesus is praying to the Father. And that's why when you look at verse 13, it says, these things I speak. It's referring to this moment. It is a reference to all that Jesus has said to the Father in this prayer up to this point. All Jesus has said in this prayer about the Father and the Son's mutual glorification All that Jesus has said about the Father giving to the Son these 11 men for this divine task of apostleship, they've heard. 
The Son's accepting and saving those that the Father gives to the Son is what these disciples have heard. Jesus has prayed about the Son and the Father's intimate relationship and the equality that they share. So all of this truth that Jesus has spoke is in the world. It is public. It is in their hearing. And it was for a distinct purpose. Dear church, Jesus wastes no word. Jesus wastes no time. Time is of the essence for Jesus. Listen, dear friend, time is of the essence for your life as well. You don't know the, 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 when the, 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 the book closes in your life. You don't know the day when the clock stops on your existence on this earth. You do not know any of that truth. Therefore, we must what? Redeem the time. And Jesus here wastes no time. He wastes no words. Because He knows the ministry these apostles have. And He wants them prepared. And how does He prepare them? He wants them to have What? Look at the text. His joy. He says, I have spoken these things. I speak these things in the world so that. That's purpose. That's a purpose statement. They. Who is the they? The 11 apostles. Right? May have my joy made full in themselves. We read this, and you may wonder, how does this impart joy into the lives of the disciples? Right? You read that, and that's the same thought I had. You know, as we've even studied the text up to this point, you might be even saying to yourself, I haven't heard much about joy. Come on, Jesus. So how is this supposed to be accomplished? Where is this joy supposed to come from? And the reason I believe we do not see joy in this text is because you and I have a wrong understanding of Christian joy. If you turn on social media and you buy most popular books today, many popular preachers seem to want to capture your attention with an attempt of false ideas of what Christian joy is. Now here here is a little insight for you. Christian joy is founded upon, listen, it is founded upon heavenly realities. Period. That is the essence of Christian joy. Christian joy is based upon eternal, objective realities. Listen, Jesus has done nothing here in this text but talk about, listen, divine certainty. Everything Jesus has prayed to the Father about in this text is not hope so, it is not maybe, it is certainty. It is reality, it is truth that Jesus has prayed about to the Father. Jesus has prayed to the Father about the glory of the cross, verse 1. Verse 2, Jesus has prayed to the Father about how all authority has been given to the Son. In verse 4, Jesus has been glorified, has glorified the Father on this earth. These are all certainties that Jesus has prayed to the Father about. And all of these divine accomplishments and certainties that the Father and Son have accomplished, dear friend, is the foundation of our Lord's joy. You see, Jesus' joy here that he wants to transfer to the apostles was not set on some, some circumstances that they found themselves in. It is not rooted in some temporal happiness, but fixed on eternal purposes. 
Listen, Jesus' joy came from knowing that all he did in the cross, all that he did would bring about God's greatest work. The things that Jesus spoke of during this prayer was to impart into the disciples' hearing truth that would produce Christian joy. And here's a term for you. Truth-based joy. Who can erase that? Can cancer erase truth-based joy? Can a hurricane, a natural disaster, a death, can anything for the Christian have his truth-based joy erased from his or her life based upon their circumstances? And the question is, it shouldn't, right? Because we have our affection somewhere else. We have our life based on something other than the temporal and the ever-changing. Truth-based joy, the knowledge Jesus lays down on this night in the immediate hearing of the disciples was to impart the fullness of Christ's joy into their own lives. Disciples, these are the things I know to be true. These are the things the Father and I have agreed upon from eternity past that we're united upon. Nothing will change this. Knowing the basis of eternal life. Jesus, knowing that the Father was ultimately glorified in his life, he says earlier on here, Father, I've glorified your name on this earth. The joy of knowing all that the Father will give to the Son, the Son saves and the Son keeps. Everything that we've studied, everything that Jesus has prayed here is to impart truth based joy. And this is what Jesus wants these men to have. Not circumstantial joy, but joy that can stand the test of time. A joy that is impassable regardless of darkness that we might face in life. Now, there are many reasons we might love Paul, right? There are many copious list after list of why you should love Paul the Apostle Paul. But one of the reasons I love Paul is because of his outlook. How he viewed life. How he viewed his circumstance. How he viewed whether he died or lived. It was not based on his circumstances. Look at Philippians 1 for a minute. show you this. In Philippians 1.18, to summarize what Paul is saying here, models this type of joy in Philippians 1.18. He says, what then? Question mark. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this I rejoice. Yes, I will what? Rejoice. The reason Paul has such joy in the midst of a prison scene, in the midst of having opponents who were you know, discrediting Paul, saying Paul was in the ministry for the wrong reason, whatever they were saying. Paul says, what then, verse 18, in light of this, even though they're bad-mouthing me, even though I am in the worst of circumstances, what's his attitude? Poor me? Oh, what's God going to do with this situation? None, none of that. It's joy. Why? Because he was thinking horizontally? Was his joy rooted in the fact that, you know, like, well, I can't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow, you know, I'm getting a little bump in my check or I got the day off. I'm kind of happy today. Listen, joy here for Paul is rooted in a heavenly reality, and you see it in verse 18, whether in pretense or what? Are in truth, whether they do it for the wrong motive or for the right motive, he says, Christ is proclaimed. Truth-based joy. Truth-based joy says, if my suffering 
brings about the greater progress of the gospel, I'll rejoice. And then notice later on, what does he say in verse 21 about this same idea, even about, you know, looking toward his death. He says here, for to me to live is Christ and what? To die is gain. That's an eternal perspective. He says, well, if I I stay in this earth, I'm going to be like Jesus. And he says, well, if, if I die, I get to go to heaven to be with Christ. You can't steal my joy, right? Because he had an eternal perspective. And Jesus here wants to transfer his joy to the disciples' joy so that they will have joy, right? This is what Jesus is doing here in preparing them for ministry. Here's the, here's the kicker, though. Do you possess this type of joy? Joy fixed on the eternal purposes of God. And I'm just going to tell you the truth this morning, not that I would ever lie to you, is that ministry, without this kind of truth-based joy, you will dry up and blow away. And over the years of church planning, our hope has always been, and I talked about Tammy in this when I say our hope, has always been fixed on the truth of Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says what? I will build my church. Joy comes in knowing this truth. Listen, not living... Living your life by sight in ministry, it can be depressing. But living by faith, living on the eternal purposes of God, is where joy is based. Knowing that Jesus is going to keep his promise. Knowing that Jesus is going to build his church. That's where your joy rests, right? Joy can't be in ministry fixed on any other truth. It has to be fixed on eternal realities. Another essential element here that Jesus points to is found in verse 14. Not only joy, but essential element in preparing any man for ministry is the need for the word, right? Notice what Jesus says, I have given them your word. This is a critical piece to preparing these men for the ministry. Jesus tells the Father, I have given them your word. Jesus' ministry here then would, could be ultimately uh, distilled down to a word-based ministry. Where are Jesus' words recorded? Right? In the Bible. Where are Jesus' miracles recorded? In the Scripture. All of ministry, dear believer, is a word-based ministry. Period. Jesus' ministry ultimately was a word-based ministry. He says it here. Father, I've given them not His words, not what He wants the church to know, not what... He wants the disciples to understand, but he says, Father, I've given them your word. It's very specific here. So Jesus is here talking about his equipping ministry. Father, I have faithfully given these men your words is what Jesus is asserting here. Look back up with your eyes to verse 8. Jesus has already talked about this. He says, the words which you gave me, what did he say he did with them? He says, I have given to them. The words you gave me, Father, I gave to them. They received them. They accepted them. They have believed them. So here in verse 14, when we see Jesus' preparatory prayer, he says, Father, I've prepared them. I've given them your word. Now, this receiving and dissemination of the Word of God is what Jesus 
has so well established in his own ministry. And really, dear friend, it is passed down through all of church history up to this point. True ministry is the receiving of the word and the dissemination of the word. This is how uh, Christians are reproduced. This is how maturity is obtained. It's the receiving of the word. It's the giving of the word. It's the receiving of the word. It's the giving of the word. This is what Jesus' model here is. This is the cornerstone, dear friend, of all ministry preparation. Look at the details. I... Have given them your word. So here, Jesus has received something. What did he receive? He received the word the Father gave to him. Jesus in John 7, verse 16, reminds the Jewish audience there. He says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. What Jesus received from the Father, he didn't hold on to it. Right, he, he, he didn't allow that word to fall into the spiritual cul-de-sac. No, he was a, a fount of truth to others, namely these 11 men. So this is a receiving and dissemination ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at 2 Timothy briefly with me. And this is the same kind of ministry that Paul models for us, and this is just for your edification this morning, to see how what Jesus did is what the apostles did, and we see it very clearly in Paul's ministry in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Look at how he writes this to Timothy. Timothy, he says, The things which you have heard from me... In the presence of many witnesses, what does he say? Do with that truth. Entrust it. Entrust these two faithful men who will be able to do what? Teach others. I love this text because Paul here was in the receiving and dissemination ministry. What he received. He says, Timothy, I gave that to you. Now you're to give it to faithful men. So those faithful men can do what? Teach others. Dear Christian man, this is the model for your ministry. There needs to be a Paul in your life. There needs to be a Timothy in life. And there needs to be a passing on of the baton of the faith. This is what Paul is talking about. This is what Jesus did so faithfully. Turn back to John 17, verse 14. Look at what Jesus continues to say here. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Why did the world hate Jesus? Why did the world hate the apostles here? It's not what Jesus did that they hated him. But dear friend, it's what Jesus said. It's why the world hated him. In the world, Jesus says here, in his prayer to the Father, prepare yourself, basically is what Jesus is saying. Prepare yourself, apostles, for the same treatment. They're going to hate you, just like they've hated me. If you receive my word, which is the telltale sign that you're a believer, and you follow me, Buckle up, because you're going to be hated. That's what Jesus is saying. Look, if you didn't know this, I hope this will help you. Jesus was never hated because of his miracles. I mean, you feed a bunch of people, heal the blind, raise the dead. I mean, that's great. But they hated Jesus because of what he said. What he taught. Listen, at the end of the day, why does the world hate Christians? Because you go to a church building, wear nice clothes on Sunday, right? Is it because, you know, you identify as a Christian that they hate you? No, dear friend, they hate you because, especially if you are a true Christian, they hate you because of what you believe. 
They hate you because of what Jesus taught. Same reason they hate Jesus is the same way the reason they hate you, dear Christian. Jesus was hated because He said He was equal to the Father. They hated Jesus because Jesus preached an ex- ex- a very exclusive gospel, right? It was a very closed message that I am the only way, Jesus said. In Jesus' day, that wasn't popular, and it ain't popular today, and it won't ever be popular today. You can't follow your light and think you're going to end up in some relationship with whatever God you've made in your own image. You can't think that every trail leads to the top of the mountain and there we will find God. This is why Jesus was hated. And this is why you will be hated. You see, the hostilities these apostles will face because of Christ Jesus has obviously already been outlined. You can go back and look at it in John 15, verse 19. Because Jesus said, the world hates these men because of their new status in the world. Look at verse 14. Look at that new status. He says, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Right? It's a new status every Christian possesses. You're not of the world anymore. You've been saved out of the world. And you have a new address. If you, are a truly, if you are a true believer. And this is why Jesus in the next verse prays for their protection. Look at verse 15. So Jesus here is transferring to them in this prayer, this understanding of preparation and joy and giving them the word. But I want you to see here how Jesus prays for their protection. Look what he says. I do not ask... You to take them out of the world, Father, but to keep them from the evil one. I love this. Because if you're in ministry, as these apostles will be in ministry, they will be the foundation of the church. They will be the ones who will go forth and carry the ministry of Jesus Christ, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentile world. They are going to face hostility from the world because they don't belong to the world. And this is why Jesus says, because of this, not belonging to the world system anymore, Father, because they are yours, Protect them. Protect them is what Jesus says. Now instinctively, parents want to do what? Protect. Instinctively, parents want to build fences around their children, right? Through life, protecting them from all sorts of trouble and pain, putting you know, things in receptacles so they don't get electrocuted, right? That's normal, keeping them away from the vicious dog that you own, keeping them away from playing in the road when they're too small. All of these instincts are normal. We want to protect our kids. Jesus wants to protect His kids. He doesn't remove them from the danger, though, dear friend. He protects them within the danger. That's what I want you to see. Notice how Jesus phrases this. Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Don't don't snatch them out of the world. Leave them. And we need a healthy dose of this. You know, we're post, I don't know what post we are at this point when when I make this statement, but there was a season where, you know, we we lived in this this mindset that we got to unplug from the world. We got to get away from the world and we got to kind of, you know, huddle in our little holy huddles and wait for Jesus to come back. This is not how Jesus prays. If Jesus wanted you out of the world, he would have done that. And we're not to shelter in place and keep to ourselves. This is not what Jesus is advocating. This is not what Jesus is praying. Don't take them out. Quite on the contrary, he says to the disciples at the end of his 
uh, post-resurrection appearances, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. But here he's asking for their protection. And Jesus doesn't say, Father, take them out. But we're called to stay in the world. We're not to retreat from the world, but to stay in the world is what Jesus is saying for a divine purpose. Just like these apostles, their divine purpose was to fulfill their ministries. The 11 apostles would be the means for which God would spread the gospel and start the church of Jesus Christ. Now, there are three things I want to say here that you need to take home with you. One, we are to be in the world, but not of it, okay? This is one of the beautiful things about the church. One of the beautiful things about the church is that we can come out of the so-called world's thinking and be together with those who believe like we do, who love Jesus like we do, and want the same things as God wants because we're not like the world. We gather to scatter, right? We gather together so we can go in the world. And one of the ways we stay separate from the world is our community together. And if we're faithful to this community, the witness is better. Witness is better not just from the world looking in the window of the church and saying, wow, these people really love each other. I mean, Robert was, was, was making a good point in our elders meeting this morning, our prayer time. And he says the wonderful thing about, you know, a true elder, you know, board or, or group plurality of elders is to have a group of men who really love each other in spite of differences. Differences meaning like, well, I have a, this opinion, I have that opinion. But the, what trumps all of that is our deep concern for each other personally, spiritually, and for the glory of Christ in His church. And when the world looks in the window at that, they go, wow, what what kind of weird folks are these that they really care for each other? That's a witness. And you can't be faithful in the hostile world that wants your death if you're not here. If you're not involving yourself in the community where iron sharpens iron, where we pray for one another. And I tell people all the time, dear friend, you show your support by your feet. Right? By showing up. By serving. And the one way we cannot, we can stay in the world but not be of the world is is having this close community called the church, the body of Christ. Second thing we can see here is that God has called us to stay in the world, not to retreat from the world. Yeah, the world's scary, isn't it? Let's be honest. The world is scary. But do we believe in the Word of God? Do we believe in what the Scriptures teach about its power? Its ability to save, its ability to sanctify, its ability to give us clarity in staying in this world. Yes, it does. That's why Paul could confidently say, we don't grieve when someone dies like the world grieves. Because we have a truth-based joy, right? We understand. That's how we can stay in this world together until Christ comes or we Or the Lord calls us home. Third thing that we can pull from this is when Jesus says, don't take them out of the world, is that God has called us to reach the world. To reach the world. He's called you and me to stay here to reach the world. He hasn't saved you to sit and soak till he comes back. He saved you for the purpose of opening your mouth to a lost person and give them the gospel. God is sovereign, and He has, in His ordained sovereign purposes, has ordained means to accomplish His sovereign ends. And that is evangelism. And that is you. And that is me. Opening our mouth with truth. 
So when Jesus says here, do not, Father, take them out of the world. This is what I believe we can imply from this this statement. But what does he say? But keep them from the evil one. So Jesus' request, don't remove them, but protect them. Protect them. That's the contrast here with the conjunction, the, the conjunction but. But keep them in the world. Keep them from the evil one. Listen, dear friend, you've got a new address. You've got a new status. Therefore, you're public enemy number one for Satan, right? And this is why Jesus asked the Father to do this very thing. This is even why Jesus, when he taught the disciples how to pray, to pray in this way, right? To say, Lord, deliver us from temptation, deliver us from evil. That's how we are to pray. And Jesus prays for us, or for these disciples in the same way. So the request is protection from who? It's, in, in here it's saying the evil one, or from some translators, some manuscripts talk about just from evil but I think it's specific to pointing to Satan. Listen, dear friend, Jesus knows believers, listen, you have zero power over the old, wise, and evil serpent. You have zero ability in that game. Do you understand that? Ephesians 6. Turn there. Paul talks about this. In Ephesians 6, he calls us to stand against the devil, not in our strength or in our might. What does he say, though, in verse 10, Ephesians 6, 10? He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There is nothing in there about you doing anything except standing. And that is standing in the power of Christ. Standing in the power of God is the call. And I love this prayer by Jesus because Jesus' prayer is protection for us. For these 11 men. That they will not fall prey or come under the attacks of Satan and not survive. Now think about this. If we, if we look at the immediate context here, Peter, for example, on this very night falls prey to his pride, believing he can stand on his own merits against Jesus' enemies. Like, Jesus, you say you're going to be arrested. You say all this is going to happen. But guess what? Not on my watch, brother. Right? I mean, that's Pride. And then Jesus goes and tells Peter, Peter, Satan has asked permission. Satan has no authority to deal with you. Satan has no power over you that God does not allow for his purposes. This is how sovereign and how all authority belongs to God. For Satan to touch any believer's life, it has to come through the loving fingers of our mighty God. He says, Peter, whatever. Satan has desired to sift you, but guess what? Jesus prays for Peter. Right here. Protect Peter, Father. He he says great things, but you know Peter's heart. But you know what he can and can't do, Father. Protect him from the evil one. That's a blessing. Satan wants to sift you, Peter, and I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And the basis for this protection comes for for us in verse 16. Look at it. Jesus again reiterates. He started this language in verse 14, but look what he says in verse 16. He says, they are not of the world. Talking about the disciples. Father, they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They're the select few, Father, that you need to protect because they're not like the world. They are yours. They're like me, is what Jesus is saying. And the basis of this protection for the apostles is the apostles' status in the world. They are like Christ. We are not 
of this world, is what Jesus is saying. And they will need divine protection. So Jesus, in this particular prayer for the apostles, lays out these distinct features, right? Important features. Features that bring out such wonderful truth to help us even today as Christians have joy, right? Have joy in the midst of hardship. And to know that we, we have the Word, right? We have God's Word. You have it laying in your lap today. The words from God that equip us with all knowledge and all truth. Everything we need for life and godliness has been granted to us through Christ, through His Word. And it has been graciously given to you, dear believer. And then we have protection, just like these apostles. You're not there out on your own, suffering in silence. At the whims of fate and at the whims of the devil's schemes, right? No, dear saint, that is not true. You are protected if you're in Christ by the Father. We should be the happiest, the most joyful, the ready to serve, the ready to go into the most darkest reaches of our world with this truth because we know our Father is what? He is at work. The Lord has prayed for us and He is going to use us for His glory. Let's pray as we close. Father, we just thank you for this feature that we have plumbed the depths of as we think about the Lord's prayer for the apostles. And Father, as we contemplate and allow this truth to marinate in our souls, Father, use this message to change our lives. Use your word to radically shift us from a position in life where you know, we may live in fear, we may live in uncertainty, but, but Jesus, you want us to have your joy. You want us to have your peace. And Father, help us to believe what we know. Help us to live victoriously in the truth. Help us to know, Father, that you, if we are in your Son, that you love us so much. You want to protect us, and you're going to, it doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face hardship in life. It's not, it doesn't mean, Father, that when we speak the truth that we're not going to be hated by the world, but we know you're going to protect us. Because ultimately, Father, we're eternally protected. And Father, we fear you, the one who can kill both body and soul. And we know, Father, because of that, because of our faith in your son Jesus, that our eternal condition is fixed. So death, where's your sting? And I pray, Father, that this truth helps move us in ministry and life and in the building of even Grace Bible Church, Lord, into the future that you would use this truth to help us glorify you. And I just pray this in Jesus' name.